Welcome, Wendy. Thank you very much. And um, it's great to be here. Um, it's nice to see uh, virtually many of you, although my screen is a little Brady Bunch like, so I can't see quite all of you. Um, but um, it's a privilege uh, to be here and uh, be a part of um, what I know are always really exciting monthly meetings and to be a part of this one that is focused on life sciences. So um, I was asked to say a few words. There's a couple of us that are just going to make some opening remarks and then we're going to get into the fun stuff, which uh, is really the panel and the discussion. So um, I was asked to just talk a little bit about our ecosystem and life sciences is a ex very exciting area um, to be in right now. It, uh, it already was before um, COVID-19 and it's just up to the ante of the day-to-day -day excitement. So um, just a little bit about our ecosystem. We have um, amazing assets in BC with our world-class research and academic institutions. Over the last year or two, we uh, have been able to call ourselves the home of multiple anchor companies rather than just one, uh, which it used to be. We've got some great momentum in our small and medium size um, uh, enterprises, and we are continuing to attract more interest from around the globe. Um, LSBC hosts an investor summit every year. And uh, this year it was double in size with 35 companies presenting and investors coming from Canada, the US, Europe, and Asia. So clearly there's interest in BC, which is really exciting. COVID-19 um, recently gave BC companies a great opportunity to demonstrate um, our leadership with companies like Upsellera, who were very early on in a partnership with BARDA out of the US. And um, I think Upseller has almost become a common household name in the life sciences sector in BC now, um, with uh, partnerships with Eli Lilly, receiving money from the federal government, and really making some significant investments and inten intentional uh, decisions to stay in Vancouver to continue to grow, um, which is really fantastic. We also have Starfish Medical in, uh, in our province, which is the largest medical device design company in Canada. And they very quickly pivoted um, and got into the ventilator business and are currently in the process of building 7,000 ventilators for the use within our Canadian market. Um, another is Precision Nanosystems, who's in collaboration to co-develop a vaccine. Um, and then we have multiple digital health companies that have also played leadership roles, Thrive, Starling Mines, to name a few. So you can see our little BC companies that not only have grown significantly are really leading the way um, across the country and in some cases nationally. So for those of you that are in the startup stage, it can happen and it can happen being a BC Canadian company. Um, since joining Life Sciences BC, I've been really struck by all the people that are moving the needle forward. And I think that is one of the uniquenesses of our sector by being a little bit of outside of maybe some of the bigger centers like Boston, the collaboration that happens amongst our sector is amazing. And if you continue to network amongst each other and network within the community, you'll see that you can very quickly solve some of your business problems um, much faster than you might have in a, in a larger center. So what's ahead for us? Um, ingenuity and hard work is gonna to continue to be the theme in life sciences. Many people say there's a lot easier businesses to work in than this one, but there's also a lot of reward that you get out of being in this sector. Um, we, uh, we will continue to probably gain a lot of momentum on the world stage as the companies, many of the companies that I've mentioned continue to draw um, international attention and domestic attention. In the last couple of days, we've had uh, Chinook Therapeutics, which just recently raised an, another round of significant funding. Abcelera, in addition to what I said, also had a round of funding that they were able to close. Um, so you can see lots of people are paying, paying attention to us. Digital health is obviously going to continue to emerge as, major, as uh, a major force. I think um, COVID-19 gave a little bit of a gift to virtual health in the sense that probably a little bit more out of necessity than the system was ready for. We all of a sudden are having virtual doctor's appointments, which I know many people are really excited about. Still, we need to get through the massive change in the system that that requires, but great to see the embracing of, of a new type of delivering the healthcare model, which can not only ultimately provide better care 
if we unleash the data along with this, more better care, but also can help us drive better cost savings and cost effective delivery of that. So to build our momentum, um, you know, what we often talk about in life sciences is it starts with good science and we need to remember that. So I don't want to say that the world hasn't changed, but in some ways it hasn't. We need to start with good science and we're lucky in BC that we have great science. And then that, you know, good science, capital follows good science. So yes, there are a lot of things that we need in place to continue to drive momentum into capital. And I know Jason will have a lot to say about that. But at the same time, let's stay core to our roots that the capital does follow the good science. And then talent, access to markets, which I think is another thing that has happened over the last couple of months is that we've seen an openness to buying Canadian innovation, accepted a little bit more than it might have been in the past. Um, and data. Data is incredibly important in that life sciences sector. And we continue to try and find that balance between protecting privacy while using data to drive better health outcomes and better processes within our system. So I think you'll see a lot happening with that as we move forward. Um, COVID-19 has also uh, sort of jumped us into a very interesting conversation around contact tracing which many life sciences companies will play a significant role in as we, as we go forward and figure out where, where contact tracing is going to land in, uh, in what is a quite complicated discussion between balancing privacy, medical safety, public health, and data systems. Um, we also see increasingly AI being utilized in our sector in a way that can advance drug development, um, product development, and again, decision-making tools uh, throughout, the, throughout life sciences. So watch for uh, continuing trends related to that. And I think with that, I'm going to um, now turn it over to Lana. Is Lana on the line? I know she was- Hi, Wendy, I'm here. Oh. Hi, Lana. Um, so I'm going to close that off as my opening remarks and let Lana Janes uh, jump in. She is a venture partner with Admare Bio Innovations. Lana is a biopharmaceutical industry veteran with over 20 years of pharmaceutical development experience that spans full life cycle of therapeutic product development. As a venture partner, Lana is focused on identifying compelling areas of strategic commercial opportunity in the therapeutic space and driving the creation and acceleration of new companies to develop those opportunities into innovative therapies. She's also an associate with the Creative Destruction Labs and a board member for multiple startups across North America. So over to you, Lana, to say a few opening words. Great, thanks, Wendy, for that great introduction. And I'm really pleased to be here today. Thank you, Theozel, for um, inviting me. Um, just a f uh, I wanted to take just a few minutes because I know we have a panel discussion following this to talk a little bit about what Admare does and particularly now in light of the COVID-19 crisis and Wendy your remarks brought up some great uh, points that I'd like to focus on. Um, I was lucky enough I moved to Vancouver in 2005 and for 12 years was at QLT and that was probably the, one of the key anchor companies that started out all the way back in 1980 um, as probably one of the first spin-out companies of any uh, university setting in British Columbia. I think the company was fully incorporated in 1986. It went public in the late in the 90s and um, had its first drug approval in the year 2000. When I joined that company, there were 500 pe 550 people globally. We had built our own facility on Great Northern Way. And um, it was an exciting time in the biotech community. And what we used to like to call the company was Biotech U, where it was a university where people could really learn how to build companies and get that hands-on experiential uh, time on developing drugs. And I was really fortunate to be able to do that. And, um, and I think that's what we're all trying to do is build those next companies. And we've, we're doing you know, an amazing job, as Wendy pointed out, of is growing. Um, you know, you've got Zymeworks. There's just a lot of really exciting um, companies emerging from the, from the um, ecosystem here. Just a little bit about what Admari does. Um, so we're a venture uh, incubator here, and we're made up of three member organizations. Some of you might have known us by 
we're the artist formerly known as CDRD. Um, and uh, last year we merged with another um, organization out of Quebec called Neomed. Um, and both of those organizations were focused on translating leading academic research into new companies of scale and technologies. And then recently this year, we also merged with Accelerex, which is also uh, was an important organization to help drive innovation, um, moving through into that seed stage of fundraising through up to Series A and trying to provide those additional business components. So effectively now we've brought those three teams together. And really what we do, we always say, we, here's what we do fundamentally. We, so we translate, we work with academics, um, to help translate their research into companies of scale and drive it forward to those generating those valuable data sets that can attract investment and that can keep the science going. And, you know, we always talk about capital, but capital is really the oxygen that drives the science towards the clinic. We're focused in the therapeutic space, so we always talk about driving it towards the clinic. We also help existing companies scale up. Um, and so we work with a variety of dis different SMEs across Canada to help drive their businesses if they're at a critical point where they need data generation or some additional drug development expertise, um, um, uh, management expertise or the like, we help, we help there. And thirdly, we really try and train the next generation of highly qualified personnel. And what this means is, again, helping to build the ecosystem. A lot of you are young innovators here and, um, you know, starting out on your first ventures or your fifth venture or 10th venture, there's always something else to learn and um, being able to have access to mentoring and some additional skill sets is what we're here to do. And um, we actually have some pretty interesting programs that I wanted to take the opportunity to pitch to you today, and then I'll hand the mic back to Wendy. We have something called the Admari Executive Institute, and this is a program that's co-sponsored by Pfizer Canada, and, it, and it's where um, young innovators who are starting out in their in their companies and perhaps are in the mid to uh, later stages in their career, so at a senior director or vice president level, with uh, teams to oversee, um, we we have a it, it's a it's a free academy, and um, we we uh, accept this year we just finished one cohort and we had about twenty individuals in it from across Canada, and uh, we help bring and provide those leadership skills for you to help drive your organizations. So if you're interested or know somebody who might be interested in this really exceptional training program to build up leadership skills in this space, um, check out our website at Admare that the cohort is now accepting applications. It's free to apply. And then the other program that we're building right now is something that we're calling the Biovation Bioinnovation Scientist Program. And it's a program to help um, perhaps people who are just coming out of uh, school, uh, graduate school, uh, in the first few years of their career to help them have the higher level overview of what does it mean to drive therapeutic companies. And um, this is going to be a virtual and experiential program. So I'd encourage you to check that out too when it, um, when it uh, is, um, is uh, open up for um, applications. So really happy to be here today. And I think there's a lot to talk about, Wendy, in terms of what we've been seeing in terms of the COVID-19 crisis and how that illustrates the value that we can help bring to uh, companies and researchers in our ecosystem. So thanks for letting me uh, give me a few minutes to chat. Thanks, Lana. Um, well, we will get more into that um, in the panel, but that was a, a great overview and um, sounds like a, a, another new exciting program coming out of Admare, so that's fantastic. I'm now going to ask Jason um, Robertson to speak. Jason is the Vice President of Investments at uh, Nimbus Synergies. He leverages over 20 years of experience in um, health and technology and also as an entrepreneur, mentor, and investor. He's the co-founder and vice president of Nimbus, which leads early stage financing in innovative and complementary health technology companies in British Columbia. Prior to founding Nimbus, Jason held business uh, operations roles for Aquinox Pharmaceuticals, where he was responsible for M&A licensing, IP contracts, and outsourcing and relationship management. 
He was intricately involved in the company's raising of more than 60 million in VC financing, a successful NASDAQ IPO, as well as 150 million in um, partnership with Estellas Pharma. So he is our uh, current resident expert on in the investor side of this, and that's what he's gonna talk a little bit about. He serves on a few boards of directors, uh, Alvida Help, uh, Claris, Life Booster, and Xenia Technologies. So Jason, I'm gonna let you say a few words now. Great. Thanks so much, Wendy, really appreciate it. <clears throat> so I, I think a number of uh, folks on the call will uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, be aware of Nimbus uh, in greater or lesser extent, but just as a, as a brief background, uh, building on what Wendy said. Um, so uh, Nimbus is an a, a early stage uh, a VC firm. Uh, we have a $20 million investment program uh, focused on uh, digital health and health technology uh, innovators and, and companies in, in British Columbia. Um, and and I, you know I think it's a it's a it's a you know important uh, you know conversation in light of the, the current global circumstance around around COVID to kind of talk about our, our genesis, um, and and that really stemmed about three years ago um, when you know I think to both Lana and, and Wendy's points uh, we've had a very robust and and healthy life sciences uh, community. Um, with uh, some amazing um, uh, innovation being commercialized out of our local research institutions, world-class uh, research uh, being done. Uh, but what we identified a few years back was that um, we were starting to see uh, a crossover between what was happening in the life sciences with our also um, you know, sort of strongly growing tech community and tech sector. Um, and so we were starting to see these innovators uh, bring these two pieces together, uh, but we were starting to see these ventures uh, really not get off the ground or, or gain, you know, sort of meaningful traction. And, and we hypothesized that really stemmed from, uh, you know, the life sciences uh, financing community sort of focused on, on that piece and understanding how to invest, you know, in, in the 10 to 15 year drug development process. Um, and, and then likewise on the tech side, uh, there being a, a bit of a, a you know, concern uh, and, and anxiety around uh, regulatory and, and other uh, go-to-market issues associated with the, with the health sciences space. Um, and, and so Nimbus, uh, you know, recognizing this want to play a, a leadership role uh, and step in. And so we, uh, we do lead financings for, for those early stage companies. And we really step in, um, you know, after a company has uh, probably uh, through, through many in this room, which we are uh, uh, incredibly grateful for and appreciative of, um, you know, when a, when a company has probably raised a, a couple of rounds of angel financing um, and has really found a, a traction point um, in an early sort of beachhead market, um, uh, has some revenue and, and is really looking to scale that. And, and it's become, I think, more critical now than ever, um, especially with, with uh, the amount of capital flowing into to the markets at the moment, uh, especially down south, um, uh, because um, as that money has flown into the markets, uh, the expectations from uh, later stage investors has increased. And, and so the proof points to get a Series A investment done, let's say, uh, has, has become uh, incre increasingly more challenging for a startup to hit. And so Nimbus is really focused on helping to bridge uh, that gap for our VC innovators uh, between those early stage investments and getting them uh, ready and lined up uh, to be able to receive the larger investment from, uh, from follow on institutional VCs uh, leading those Series A. Um, you know, I think as, as uh, you know, Landon and, and Wendy both mentioned, and, and we'll really get into it a lot more, I think, in the panel, um, you know, we've seen uh, a tectonic shift, to say the least. Uh, I'll use the oft-used, unprecedented word uh, right now, uh, you know, in this current circumstance where um, I think we're definitely seeing the acceleration of, of health technology adoption. You know, I think uh, it's not overstating it to say that we're seeing... Um, uh, you know, uh, years of adoption, uh, uh, acceleration into, in, into about a few months, uh, driven, you know, as, as Wendy noted by necessity, um, uh, whether it's uh, in the primary care space or in the health uh, system uh, space. Um, you know, I think when it comes to, to fundraising, which we'll talk a little bit more about, um, I think we continue to, to see and, and um, uh, talk about uh, really, I think the, the greatest impact right now is to early stage venture, to, to early stage ventures. Uh, you know, I think later stage ventures, uh, you know, with, with large revenues, are still seeing uh, active financial markets and are able to get the, the capital they need to continue their growth strategies. Uh, the early stage companies, I think, are 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 the ones at greatest risk and and the ones that uh, you know uh, need the most help at this time. And and so you know, as much as I can encourage all of those, uh, you know. Uh, 
uh, participating in this call today that, that are investors, uh, please uh, go out and support your local uh, health technology investments. Um, uh, they need it now more than ever, and, and the work that they're doing is, is uh, critical uh, and foundational, I think, to, to where our future is going to go. Um, uh, you know, I, I think um, we'll get into a little bit more in the in the in the in the panel, so I want to sort of uh, uh, pause there. But um, I think we can talk a little bit more about um, uh, you know which companies are are likely to see the greatest risk um, uh, in the early stages, and, and talk a little bit more about that. But um, thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to Wendy. Thanks, thanks, Jason. That's um, a great uh, segue into what we want to talk about on the panel. So I'd like to introduce our additional panelists before I kick it off. Um, and so the first one is Jeff from Claris. Does everybody know Jeff? I don't even know how people are going to see you. I guess if you say something, you might jump forward on the screen. I've got five screens of people in front of me. Yeah, I, think <laughs> so, I think if I talk a little bit, it pulls me on top. Or I think it, I think you could pull for it. Okay, so there's Jeff, everybody. I'm sure many of you already know Jeff, but just if, in case you don't, Jeff has 35 years of experience with medical device startups. Uh, he has worked on surgical robotics, joint implants, minimally invasive surgery, lab automation, and blood transfusion management. Most recently, he co-founded Claris Healthcare to develop a platform for the delivery of care into the home, including social isolation prevention, remote patient monitoring, and coaching for recovery from, sur uh, from surgery. He's active in the Vancouver community through CDL, the Creative Destruction Labs, the Medical Device Development Center, and on the board of several medical device companies. And um, Jeff, it's great to have you here. Um, I, I run into Jeff in many different places, and he always has amazing words of wisdom. So uh, it's a gift to have you here with us today. Thank you. Um, we also have Richard Liggins, who is not, oh, there you are. Hopefully you're jumping ahead for everybody as well. Could you say Hi, something? Hi, Wendy. Okay, good. There you go. Hopefully everybody knows. Uh, I should be up top now. <laughs> um, okay, so Richard is the Chief Scientific Officer for Sakara Therapeutics. He is a co-founder and the CSO of this company, it's, which is a diabetes-focused company developing a drug to prevent potentially life-threatening hypoglycemia in people taking insulin. Prior to Zakara, Richard was at Admare Bioinnovations, developing a technology portfolio in early stage commercial development company co creation, where he co founded Sitka Biopharma. He spent over 20 years of experience with early clinical development and is an inventor of 21 patent families. He's an accomplished team builder and leader and medical technology innovator with broad experience in management and execution of early stage drug development. Richard obtained his PhD in pharmacy at UBC. So these are our panelists. And um, maybe I will kick it off with building off of what Jason was talking about and how the investment climate has changed somewhat um, in light of COVID-19. Sure, I, 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 you know, I can, I can continue sort of building on that, and, and, uh, you know, others. I would encourage, uh, you know, Lana and, and, and Jeff and, and Richard uh, to, to share their viewpoints as well. You know, as I said, you know, we're definitely seeing, I think, uh, you know, greatest impact and risk at the earlier stages. Um, you know, I think if you want to break down where we're seeing, um, you know, the greatest impact for, um, you know, at least, and, and again, appreciate my lens uh, primarily is on the on the health tech side. So, you know, I think Lana will have some some other insights. Uh, you know. Uh, speaking more uh, about, um, you know, sort of pure play biopharmaceutical companies. But, uh, you know, on the health technology side, um, you know, I think there's a, a, a stratification uh, between, you know, companies that are, are um, incurring product risk right now versus go-to-market risk, right? So if you can think of a company that's in, you know, very early stages, that's working on a, a prototype um, and, and sort of finalizing, uh, you know, product before they're, you know, getting ready to sort of launch a beta or, or, or you know, truly go to market, you know, those companies, I think, um, are early enough that there's still, um, there's still capital available to them for a number of reasons. You know, again, I think uh, probably, you know, lower capital need, uh, certainly, but I guess, uh, you know, if they can, if they can sell the product and sell the vision, um, you know, there is capital available to them because that product risk is not going to be impacted by the current state of affairs, right? And, and so if they need sort of the next nine to 12 months to build up product, 
I think they can find the capital to do that. I think the companies that really are, you know, product ready and, and launching and going to market right now, we're seeing, uh, you know, the, the, there is a reluctance or a hesitancy around companies, you know, that, that may be incurring more go to market risk. Um, and it's, it's understandable. Um, you know, I was saying to someone the other day and, and one of my favorite sort of, uh, you know, sort of adages, which is, you know, investors uh, can price risk, but we can't price uncertainty, right? And I think right now we're living in a very uncertain world. Um, and it's not clear, um, you know, what the future is going to hold right now. And so, you know, if you're going after a market that has been um, impacted, uh, you know, in greater or lesser extent by, by the current situation uh, and pandemic, um, you know, it's hard to imagine um, when that's going to change um, and when is the right time to get behind. And so, um, I think there's, you know, sort of the compounding factors of, of um, uh, you know, uh, you know, when are things going to uh, not be resolved, but when do we feel like we have certainty and clarity around what the future is going to look like? And then what do we believe the new normal is going to look like? And, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about that. There will absolutely be a new normal coming out of this circumstance. Um, and, 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 you know, how does that play into whatever the, the venture's thesis is? So, um, you know, I think companies, unfortunately, that, that you know, had some early revenue and, and some early traction are the ones that are, are probably most impacted uh, uh, from, from what we're seeing in our, in our space. Hey, Jeff, if I can ask you to maybe comment on that, because you, you, you can represent multiple stakeholders in, in this dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, my own company has been, you know, banging the drum for delivery of care directly into the home for, uh, you know, eight years now. And all of a sudden, uh, late March, everyone started to agree with us. It's kind of nice. But, you know, th that's, uh, that's serendipity and a, a lucky example. I think Jason's most important point there was, what is the new normal going to look like? And I think that's what all investors need to be, be thinking about is, you know, there are, you know, startups and organizations, good organizations like Starfish, that are making a little bit of hay with COVID and, you know, trying to get something going right now. But the question that unfortunately some of the young startups that have spoken to me have not been asking themselves is what is the world gonna look like when this pandemic is over? And it will be over at some point. And now what that means is that either things are going to go back to normal, whatever that means, or they're gonna go back to new normal. So if you've got a, uh, you know, a fantastic new technology that really should be there anyway, whether or not there's a pandemic. But the pandemic drives the acceptance and the adoption of this new technology, then it's a great opportunity. But if you're trying to ride something which says, you know, COVID drives this business plan, well, then that's a really bad plan because COVID's gonna go away again. So the, the real opportunities here are all around the new normal. If you can you know, use this pandemic to drive new ways of delivering health care and managing disease that should really be there anyway, there's lots of great reasons for them to be there, then this makes it a huge opportunity. Uh, that, I think, is one of the, you know, the most important theses to look at when you're, when you're considering investment and deciding where investment money is going to go. It's got, it's got to be more than just the short-term problem. That's my little okay. rant. Um, I just want to comment, if people want to add questions to the chat, I will do my best to follow the chat as we're talking. Um, so I wanted to turn um, to Richard, who is uh, got this amazing business going on. And um, how have you seen that it seemed that the world all turned to everything COVID for a while? Were investors prepared to talk to you? Did you you know, part of the new normal is everything won't always be about COVID. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's certainly the, it's the curse of interesting times, I would say for sure. And in our case at, at Zucara, we actually closed a Series A financing uh, rate, I guess, right in the week that the market went a little bit off, you might say, uh, in uh, late March. And uh, so there was, you know, there was some, uh, some pins and needles, I guess. <laughs> To, to think and rethink what the, what the investment scenario needed to look like and what I think importantly what the timeline needed to look like uh, in order to weather the storm and and uh, so we're our outlook and what we're hearing from similar companies is uh, if we can manage about us uh, to enable to allow for about a six month delay 
two things and and uh, and plan accordingly, then we should be able to weather okay. We're fortunate, and we actually haven't seen that much of a delay ourselves, but um, but we are planning that, that delays could be in that time frame. So it does does tell you that it's a relatively short term issue. This you know uh, I, I wouldn't say it. Um, it's a distraction, I guess. It's the refocusing around COVID. Um, but what we're seeing in terms of that refocusing is that it's uh, it's taking attention off of other areas. Certainly, some of the investment uh, that you look for as a small company uh, on the non-dilutive side uh, that could be leveraging for investment uh, from charities, from foundations, uh, from incubators, that kind of thing, from government agencies are very much swinging. Uh, and so while as a company we're not swinging to chase COVID, we're finding that some of the dollars that we might be looking for to augment investment uh, and other small companies might be looking for to, to uh, leverage their dilutive investments, um, those have swung quite quickly towards COVID only or COVID focused. Uh, and uh, so review times have been impacted, charities are uh, some, some of them retrenched um, with respect to how quickly they're spending out. Uh, and then other areas are funding only, only COVID related. So uh, it does require a bit more creativity and, and um, I guess awareness of opportunities. Uh, but there are, there are uh, mandate focused um, dollars out there that uh, we think that, that if they've slowed down now, they, they will bounce back. Uh, our, uh, our financing was to enable us to move into the clinic uh, this year in phase one studies, uh, we, we closed 21 million through uh, Perceptive's Ontogeny Venture Fund uh, to fund phase one and phase two studies. And so we've been really very much gearing up and uh, we've seen impacts operationally around COVID. Uh, those have been in the area of, uh, of uh, manufacturing uh, and uh, lab bandwidth. Uh, we have a number of, of collaborations with uh, academic institutions and, and so on, as many small companies do. And of course, their labs have been shut down and shut down indefinitely. Uh, that's part of managing that expected six month delay. We've uh, moved past those in terms of being on our critical path to enter the clinic. So it hasn't been a, a primary concern, but uh, certainly losing the ability to do research for the short term in the ac academic sphere uh, due to institutional shutdowns is, is a significant thing. But again, I expect that's a short-term problem. And so it's really a matter of looking out the few months that we think it'll take to get back uh, in action there. Uh, so there's been a number of, of those sorts of impacts. Um, none, none of them has been critical. I think there isn't really one thing that's pretty much stopping operations for company. It's really, uh, really managing the many small issues that crop up on a weekly basis and just the dynamic aspect of things and the constant change in things, um, keeping abreast of that and being able to pivot and manage uh, in an agile fashion. And Lana, may, maybe you want to um, pick up on this discussion of not being able to get into labs with Admare having facilities in both British Columbia and substantial facilities in Quebec. Um, how has Admare pivoted through that, knowing that you know labs all often help deliver the milestones that are expected to prove either both science or to also get you know get over that next hurdle? Yeah, you know, Wendy, it's been really interesting. I think that this is something that we've been facing across the whole pharma and biotech ecosystem in terms of the closures. Um, at our end at Admari, so it was two very different worlds that we had depending upon the province that we were in. So we have facilities in Quebec and in British Columbia. In Quebec, laboratory services were deemed essential services. And so our facilities there, and we have, um, we have a, a large innovation center there that hosts over 30 uh, small companies, and we're actually in the process of building even more, a, a second facility there that will be able to house um, a lot of additional new fledgling companies that need those critical, um, very early stage labs and bricks and mortar footprint to be able to generate data. They were able to um, continue being opened during the crisis, of course, under very strict um, social distancing and PPE um, 
requirements and, and different guidelines and policies to try and protect everyone's uh, health. In uh, British Columbia, our facility, so we made the decision starting in um, March 11th actually to start to send home all of the non-lab based staff to telecommute from home and then eventually made the decision that um, all of our programs could be um, halted temporarily without material impact to them and we closed our facilities. Um, what does that mean? The good news is that we're working to get them open, a rolling opening as of next week. So we're really excited about that. But what that meant is that we had to do a lot of work and I'm sure a lot of you on this call have been doing that and Richard alluded to this. It's not just our closure, but it's the closure of the organizations that we that we work with, whether it's CRO, whether it's PIs, academic centers, clinical centers, all of which had different closure restrictions. So keeping programs alive, keeping the momentum, and also trying to deal with how will we meet these critical um, milestones for data generation um, has been quite challenging over the past quarter. And I'm sure a lot of people on this call have been, um, have been dealing with that very issue. So I think uh, what I've been telling uh, some of the small companies that I work with, not only through Admare, but also through the Creative Destruction Labs event is, if you're holding on and managing to keep sane and um, trying to be in a position where you can get up and running again as the world starts to move into the new normal, then I think that's your bench line for success at this point um, to do the best that you the best that you can. And I wonder, Wendy, if I could also just mention something teeing off on some of the earlier speakers around the challenges in the therapeutic space, since uh, Jeff and Jason are focused um, a lot in the med tech space. Richard's company is a great, and we miss you, Richard, back in Mari, um, is a great example of the type of companies that can grow out of an incubator like Admari. But I think one of the real challenges has been for young companies to Jason's point, for, very, for young fledgling companies who are perhaps getting that initial seed investment, angel investing, a lot of that has been put on, uh, has put, put on hold or um, it's, you, know, the, you might be able to manage the relationships that you had before this crisis. It's hard to initiate fundraising rounds and meet new investors over the past three months. So there's been a temptation and a rush towards there's well, what money is flowing? The money that has been flowing is government money um, available for COVID-19 research. And I think this is one of the key things that uh, we've been seeing. It's that rush towards funding. And I think what I would say is that there's a large focus on that right now. And I think when you're looking in the therapeutic space, the timelines for development and and uh, value creation are longer than a med tech device typically or in the health tech field. And so if you are a young company and you're thinking about, do I move towards trying to bring in COVID-19 funding to keep the lights on to try and drive my company? I think it's really critical that you talk to some, you know, if that's not an area of your expertise, to talk to people who have experience in the drug development space, in the therapeutic space, to talk about those timelines and to think about, I'd love to be able to, one, I want to help. That's first and foremost, companies want to help. And secondly, do I take this money? The question is really going to be, will this be an opportunity for you to build your company and to demonstrate the value that your technology has um, where COVID is one of the many ways or perhaps a lead way that your technology can be deployed as opposed to I'm completely pivoting 180 degrees my company towards COVID because that's where the funding is right now. And I think that there's some real concerns. I think that that's something that you should um, think about very carefully given the fact that as Jeff alluded to, the new normal will be coming and you wanna think about if you have long development timelines, where your company will be if you've completely pivoted towards COVID-19 and um, you know, the, the market that you're building towards will have changed substantially in, in, in the near term in the next few years. So something I think that um, I thought I wanted to bring up as well, because it, it's really an important message to think carefully about.
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank I, you, Lynn. Can I just go I would, that one, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, I was going to move to this place oh. and think um, exactly that. And I've had, I've, I've spent an extraordinary amount of time talking to companies that wanted to become PPE manufacturers or do something with into the COVID-19 space, which it comes from, as you say, a lot of, um, I want to help. I see an opportunity and I see a gap. And those are usually, you know, good things that bring an emerging business idea forward. Um, so Jason, I'll turn it over to you because it'd be interesting, you know, I'd like to hear your perspective of that. But I also want to, you know, we're, we all talk about the new normal. We're only going to know that we're in the new normal in a rear view mirror perspective. And so it's not like it's a date that we're all going to wake up one day and say, here we are, we're in the new normal. It, it's going to be an evolution. And um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jason, to talk about this shift or, 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 or desire to, you know, follow the money that is currently in a particular space and how, what does that actually mean? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I really, uh, you know, sort of echo a, a lot of the sentiments of, of Jeff and Lana, and, and uh, you know, I think we had a really great uh, sort of pre-session on this, and, and you know, Lana and I are, are I think, uh, uh, you know, responding to this in real time through our involvement with with Creative Destruction Labs, and uh, you know, I think you know, entrepreneurs and and I guess you know the the angel investors that that are going to support them, I think, need to be mindful in terms of you know what is the company doing that is um, you know, positively opportunistic to, to, to the point of, of capitalizing on, on non-dilutive you know, funding sources that may be available. Uh, and, and you know, as Richard said, you know, I mean, I think uh, uh, virtually all of that, uh, that, that used to exist pre-COVID has now transitioned to you know, supporting the COVID response. But I think from, from an investor or a mentor perspective, you know, we're sitting there and saying, you know, is this truly uh, you know, as Jeff was alluding to the future state, you know, post COVID and, and does the business model apply or is this a distraction? And, and I, I would posit that, you know, a, a significant majority of the, the ventures that we're discussing, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of, you know, COVID strategies with, it, it's probably more of a distraction than, than, than not. Um, now, if you're a young company and you can't uh, find capital through other means, uh, you know, if you, you think you're going to be a financeable investor, financeable company, and you can't find, you know, the, the capital to do that, you know, maybe this is your only path, but, but I, I guess I would, you know, strongly, uh, you know, sort of caution, um, you know, to Jeff's point, if, if this is not, um, you know, a fundamental uh, business model that you can build coming out of the, the current circumstance. And, and, you know, I think the other point that I made uh, earlier that, that I think is, is prescient right now is, is um, you know, we are still so early in the current circumstance, right? And, and you know, uh, you know, this kind of comes to, to some of Len and, and, and Richard's comments as well. Um, uh, you know, it, it's hard to believe that it's only been three months. And, and I think, you know, everyone should take, a, take stock of what we thought was true three months ago when this started versus what we think is true today. And what do we think is going to be true three months from now? Right. And so, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Wendy, to your point, you know, a lot of companies may come out the gate, you know, looking at PPE or ventilators or all these other things. And, you know, are those sustainable? Are those going to be necessary? Are they even proven and definitely going to be required on a go forward basis? You know, I, I again, I, 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 you know, sort of made the, the comment that, um, you know, ventilators is one of those areas that, that we're sort of learning new research and maybe those aren't actually as valuable um, and necessary as we thought originally, right? And so think of all the companies that have pivoted uh, to that and, and maybe that wasn't the right pivot. Um, so, so I think as an entrepreneur, if, if your goal is to, to try to build a business, um, you got to be very conscientious of, of those strategic decisions and the impacts, um, you, know, uh, you know, but I think to Richard's point, uh, you know, uh, you know, we're guiding our companies and, and uh, you know, internally and externally, um, you know, right now uh, you really, you know, want to think about, you know, being conservative, having, you know, at least, um, you know, 18 months of, of cash on hand, ideally um, to, to kind of weather the storm, if you will, and, and get through to the other side. And I think, you know, one of the big things that, that I struggle with is the, the juxtaposition that I experience every day talking with, you know, uh, amazing individuals uh, like those in the panel and, and this meeting who are, you know, uh, ingrained in health on a day-to-day -day basis and, 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 and seeing all this, uh, uh, you know, innovation and, and sort of, um, 
the tone there is 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 conservative um to, to put candidly and yet then i walk outside my house and everyone's on the street sunbathing in the parks and it feels like you know there, there hasn't been anything and so for me there's a struggle where you know all the the brightest minds that i respect in health uh, are, are, are still conservative and they're concerned. And, and you know, I think to, to Richard's point on clinical trials, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, uh, what we're hearing from a lot of the, the, uh, the therapeutic, uh, you know, investment folks is, 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 again, caution, especially if you're in clinical trials around when you're going to be able to restart your clinical trials. And if there's, you know, we have a company that's running a clinical trial that's on hold right now because you obviously can't bring patients into a facility to run that trial. Now, we hope cautious, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, cautiously optimistically that, that things will resolve or, 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 or sort of open up in the summer. But a lot of people are suggesting there's going to be a second wave in the fall. And what does that mean for your trial that gets shut down again? And, and so if you don't have the runway to, to weather a potential second shutdown, um, you know, there, there's concerns there. So I think, um, you know, I think, you know, stepping back, um, uh, um, you know, I think I think there's still a lot of uh, you know concern in terms of what this um, you know what the timeline I guess associated with this is going to be. So um, you know, so I think part of what you're saying is um, business fundamentals still need to to be present, right? You know, Correct. We're we're still starting with good science. We need to attract capital. I mean. Our little organization took six runs at our business plan, you know, because we just don't know what's happening. Um, but, you know, you need to be able to still stick to the fundamentals of good business. I want to turn to Jeff for a minute because I know, Jeff, you uh, just have had some experiences with the, um, I guess, attraction of running after the COVID-19 dollars um, and some perspective on that as well. Uh, well, the, the ventilators thing is is a great example, or one one that helps create a good example of how this works. Uh, you know, I, uh, when this all kicked off, uh, it must have been at least ten different ventilator groups. You know, called me up and said they needed me to help them mentor them. And you know, I, it just quickly became clear that there was going to be a massive oversupply of ventilators. It obviously, actually, quite quickly became clear that ventilators weren't actually helping. Uh, you know, and it, but God, you just got to love the, you know, everyone trying to get onto these things. Uh, so an incredible amount of effort was put into something that didn't have a well thought out long-term plan. And I thought, well, you know, there are the big incumbents in the business and they're going to still be there when COVID's gone and there really won't be an opportunity for anything else. But there was a comment from Jason that actually pulled my chain back on that one. <laughs> and, well, yeah, the, you know, Draper sells you a ventilator for a hundred thousand bucks, but what if somebody could come up with a $10,000 ventilator, use all this COVID money and use this massive opportunity and put together a team of really motivated people and totally disrupt that market? That gets interesting again. You know? So it really depends on how you look at the situation and, and how you make it work. Um, and there is something to be said, you know, if your company is being driven to pieces by all your plans going out the window every 30 minutes, which uh, for me is normal, but uh, for most companies, I understand they have better, better pro, uh, projections than me. But uh, uh, go after whatever money you can get just to keep the doors open, keep the lights on, and then keep the team together. Uh, and if there's a small COVID project you can pick up that'll generate a little bit of revenue and keep you, keep you moving ahead, then do it. Uh, that's a very test, uh, time-tested uh, technique. Uh, in the mid-1980s, my company, Andronic, was in the Jack Diamond Research Center at 2660 Oak Street. We had the top floor there. One floor down, there was this company that was doing some highfalutin uh, biotech stuff that I couldn't, you know, for the life of me, understand what the heck it had to do with eyes or something. But they put up a quick production line and built pregnancy test kits. And that helped them keep the doors open and things moving along. That little company was called Quadrologic Technology. So, you know, we've got a good track record for taking advantage of whatever programs you can get to keep things going ahead. But back to Jason's you know, business basics, you got to have a vision for what the plan at the other end of the tunnel looks like and how you're going to survive that. Well, I think in our pre-meeting, you said COVID-19 is not a business case of its own. <laughs> and That's so right. the, you know, the concept of 
the still the business fundamental applies, but there are lots of opportunities for disruptors to come into the market. Um, and, um, you know, that, that again sticks to the business fundamentals and understanding what it takes to join into if you are going to do the massive pivot. Richard, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I guess, well, I think Jason and Lana, I, I heard the three month window, time window a few times already. And I think there's a bit of uh, psychology at play where, and I said, as I said, you know, we're actively managing this very dynamic situation. Each of us is responding in real time to, to a highly changing environment. I, I liken it a little bit to jumping off a cliff and, or being at the top of a roller coaster. And, and when you're in that situation, time sends, tends to seem to start to run in slow motion. And, and you think it's only been three months, and, but it seems like a lifetime. Uh, and so I would say you really need to stay true to what your timelines look like and what your, uh, what your um, technology demands in terms of timeline. So in drug development, it's, it's a longer timeline. Uh, it's longer for development, but it's also longer for cultivating the financing relationships. And when I look back across uh, our uh, accelerator funding and, and developing, um, we had an uh, in-between round uh, prior to our Series A, which um, was through uh, charitable foundations that were disease-focused. And, and those take time to develop. And, uh, and, and so you can get a little bit uh, distracted in, in this mindset that things are running in slow motion almost, and that you actually have time to pivot and time to become a COVID company, but you really don't if you're a drug development company. But, you know, we'll be into a, like you say, a new normal and we'll know when we get there, but we'll be into it long before a diabetes company like ourselves could ever turn into an infectious disease or contact tracing company. Uh, at the same time, it takes us that long to continue to develop and find, find the new relationships and develop the existing relationships for the next round of financing. And so I think part of it is staying true to your development time frame and to what it takes to develop your technology. Uh, and I think being opportunistic to find uh, revenue streams um, can make sense for some. We're a pre-revenue company. It doesn't really make sense. Uh, for us. Um, so in some respects, it's a little bit of uh, not getting distracted with the idea that we could successfully move into an area and capitalize on it before the opportunity is gone. Uh, and at the same time, not to lose the time that we have to develop these longer term relationships that we need for financing down the road. So switching gears a little bit, um, you know, as, as we talked at the beginning, um, there's a lot of great things that are happening in the life sciences sector in BC right now. I mean, you know, we, we talked about, um, you know, we ended the year uh, extremely strong. I think we had almost a record year versus many years ago of the amount of investment that came into the province. Um, we've had some, some great success stories. And, um, you know, I think the message is loud and clear. Don't make COVID-19 your primary business model unless that's actually what your business is intended to be about. Um, which, um, so, you know, take advantage of it if you can, but don't necessarily, if, if there is non-dilutive funding that matches your needs and that you can deliver against, but let's not turn the world upside down for, um, for just one particular condition. In that, in that sense, you know, there's a lot of people that are um, trying, to, trying to attract capital, in some cases trying to attract talent and stay core to their business in a world that is quite distracting because of all the things we've already talked about. What advice do you have for those companies that are trying to stay the course, uh, continue to raise capital, meet those milestones, being creative, um, do you have any advice for them as, as you know, they may be needing to say, I, I said I could make this milestone by November, but now it's going to be February, you know, what, what, how, how do you engage in those conversations with people? And maybe Jason, I'll, I'll uh, start with you. Um, you know, as you're looking at the companies that you're investing in that are just you know, needing to, for relatively good reasons, um, do a little bit of a, a regroup of what they were originally projecting. 
Yeah, and and I you know appreciate that. I'm actually more interested to hear what Jeff has to say. You know, on this, uh, you know, I think he, he he's a, a, a you know quintessential uh, sort of uh, sort of leader survivor and and being able to to to, to roll with the punches in, in 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 circumstances like this. You know, I think what I would say, um, you know, I think to the point is is you, you know you need to be um, you know creative and 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 uh, you know flexible and um, you know as Jeff was alluding to. You know, um, you know, figuring ways to to tap into capital sources, uh, be it traditional or non-traditional, as best you can. Um, you know, I think a great point is, you know, this is also an opportunity to uh, to perhaps accelerate some of your 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 uh, uh, building of your business operations. So so you know uh, you know you can't just stand still and expect um, you know if if your if your business model was uh, primarily driven by a sort of a direct face-to-face uh, -face sales process. You know, you can't expect that that we're going to go back to that anytime soon. And so now is an awesome opportunity um, for you to rethink your sales strategy and your sales model to think through a virtual model. How do I sell virtually? How do I, you know, you know, send product or or, or provide a service, uh, you know, virtually and, and conduct that process from uh, from start to finish, you know, uh, you know, via Zoom, uh, for instance. Um, uh, you know, there, there's this will if you're if you're if you're um, sort of able to put the right mindset around it, I think, you know, this circumstance will allow uh, businesses uh, to, to better set themselves up uh, for the next few years uh, than, than anything else. But I, I think you need to kind of see that silver lining, um, uh, appreciating it's going to be challenging. But I think, I, I think to your point as well, Wendy, I think you just have to be um, upfront in terms of what your uh, current opportunities and challenges are and just be reflective of, of um, you know, uh, the uncertainty that exists and, and how you can best, um, you know, reduce that risk and, and get to your next milestones. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there is a lot, I mean, look, we're doing this via Zoom. I think there actually are a lot of opportunities and examples of where people have tried to do things in different ways that have been successful. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity to take risks because everyone is so dis, I, I mean, I, I've tried to remove the word crisis from my vocabulary, but a lot of things are different. So you can try different things. And at least I find people cut you slack because you're just trying, you, you know, the world's turned upside down a little bit and you're trying new, new things. And some of them are going to stick. And those ones that don't, you're going to learn from them and move forward. So it's actually a great opportunity in a somewhat measured way to take some risks and, um, and to actually and largely our healthcare system did that out of necessity, which, okay, you can finally have virtual doctors, doctors meetings because um, we can't completely, I mean, we have essentially shut down the entire healthcare system over the last 10 weeks and we can't do that again. So those learnings from in, coming from that and being able to unleash people to be able to be creative and innovative and try new things and do that without the repercussions of, it failed so we won't try it again and move it more to the okay that didn't work so we'll tweak it and we'll try something new but just keep moving it forward and we because i'm not sure i would want to go back to the old world anyway there's some great things that have happened out of this in the ways that businesses are operating differently there's some that would be nice to go back to but there's also some really interesting opportunities that have happened and we all need to kind of keep keep that in mind as we move forward and work with our investors or try different ways to to deliver whatever we need to deliver within our businesses. Yeah, Wendy, I'm wondering if I can jump in there as well. Um, in terms of what I've been seeing on the therapeutic side, the advice I've been giving to some of the small uh, companies that we're working with. Um, and uh, I think a, a few things that I think are consistent is, you know, with the money that you do have, obviously the goal is to keep your burn rate down as much as you can. Um, that's the new normal and you won't be punished for that. I think that a critical thing is, and it, it's just common sense, is to run, do a sensitivity analysis on your budget. And I always ask um, the companies I'm working with, what's your real austerity budget? but not to the point of just not moving anywhere. And maybe that's the lowest point you get to where you're keeping the lights on and hoping for the new normal, but also thinking about 
um, I challenge companies to think about if you are spending your money right now and uh, you know, some of your activities may have been shut down, but what you are focusing on, is it still value generating in the sense that is it generating the data sets that when we, when uh, financing discussions start to open up again, new financing discussions, that you're still on track, that you're generating data that your new investors will find attractive. And hopefully that will accelerate the partnerships and investments when, when you know, as, as the world starts to open up. And I think that that's a really important to keep in, in mind because I, I pretty much am sure that every uh, company right now is having to make decisions in terms of how they're spending their money or preserving capital um, and are impacted in one way or the other um, going forward. So that seems to be uh, resonating with folks. And I think as well to your point, Wendy, that you know, look at the existing relationships that you do have and it's a real opportunity to be creative and think about, well, what are different ways I can go back to some of the partners or discussions that I've had in the past with potential partners and think about, is there a new opportunity that's been created by this? because it's not just the small companies that are impacted, it's all of them. So, you know, if you're a multinational, it's a little less, you know, you can weather the storm and perhaps you have bigger, you know, you have issues that maybe can't be addressed directly by small and medium sized enterprises. But if you're in discussions with other SMEs, um, they're in a similar situation and it's a real opportunity for creative new relationships that might be able to grow both of your businesses. So. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I've been really advising companies to, you know, it's, it's a terrible decision that you're, you know, everyone's been faced in, who do I disappoint the least today? Who, who do I, what do I slow down the least today? So trying to focus on where will you be in three months and will you be able to leverage the cash that you do have to be able to be able to drive future investments. Right. Thanks, Lena. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to ask uh, each one of our panelists to um, say some clothing, closing thoughts. Um, Jeff, can I start with you? Sure. Uh, you know, I think there's just been some great summaries in the last few minutes here, but uh, uh, I think number one for the, the startups is have a plan to survive. Just have a plan to survive. I think one of the best pieces of advice that Paul Geyer started giving out, you know, almost two months ago, was have 18 to 24 months of runway. Just have runway. Find a way to keep it. And the, the other thing that actually may be an opportunity around this is take a look at all the things you're doing and say, okay, well, there's a lot of stuff we can't do, but what can we do? Maybe we just need to change our priorities around and we could add value to the organization, even though like we can't do door to day door sales or whatever it is anymore. So look at that, see what opportunities are opening up. That's great, thanks. When you mentioned um, Paul, I thought you were going to talk about his advice on the chat, which is telling people to catch, catch up on Netflix binging. <laughs> <laughs> But, I, but his other advice is good, too. <laughs> um, okay, Richard, would, do you have some closing thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think it's, a, you know, it's, it's an opportunity. And anytime there's change, it's an opportunity. And I think that you know, we've got the benefit of we're all being a bit more patient with each other about uh, finding new ways to do things. And uh, it doesn't hurt to fail as much uh, in some respects as it might <laughs> in other times. So you've got, you do have the opportunity to try, try some new things and see what sticks. Uh, and uh, I'm talking about in terms of ways of doing things. Um, but uh, I would go back to the top of the conversation that, you know, try, try new ways to, to do what you do, but um, try to stay true to who you are uh, and stay true to your, stay true to your plan. If it was a good idea three months ago, it's probably still a good idea today. And, um, you know, it, it will be three months from now when we're looking at some of this in the rearview mirror and we want to still be there advancing your plan. And so if I find a way to, to bridge over, like I said, we're, we're ourselves, we're looking at what can we do to withstand a six month delay if we need to, uh, so, that, so that we're in a position to carry on with our mission and our plan. So stay true to your, stay true to your plans, but uh, look for new ways to do business. Right, that's great. Um, 
Jason? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll double down on, on you know, what, what Jeff and, and Richard, I think, have both said. Um, I mean, survive. Survival is critical right now. Do whatever you can. And and I think, you know, while uh, there's reason to be optimistic, um, you know, I think there's uh, plenty of good reasons why it's still uh, as important now as it was two months ago to be conservative, fiscally conservative, um, you know, as, as hard it is, as it is um, to kind of uh, pull those Band-Aids now. Um, you unfortunately do not have the opportunity to go back in time, and so if you do not, uh, you know, take some of those actions now to to allow you to survive, you know, uh, to Jeff's point, eighteen or twenty four months, uh, if that's possible, um, y y you know, you're 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 not going to have the chance to go back and 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 you know, uh, recoup recoup those uh, those dollars. Um, and I think you know, as, as as Richard said, it's a it's a it's a wonderful time to try to be opportunistic um, and and to to you know, rethink how we, how you act in your business. And, uh, you know, as I said at the outset, um, you know, we've seen a tremendous acceleration in, in at least in our space in the health technology adoption space. Um, and so, you know, I think if you can, uh, you know, make some of these changes, you know, uh, survive, uh, I think the, the future uh, could be very exciting. Yep. Lena, did you have anything more to add? Uh, I, I agree with everything that I've heard. Obviously, the, the point is you're not in it alone. <laughs> um, if you're if you're a young entrepreneur out there and trying to get your business moving. And I think that to, to echo the, the point that think, you know, the, the world is uh, changing to your point, Wendy, and make sure that in the crisis of trying to keep the lights on, keep your burn rate down and stay alive. Also take some time to think critically about how how your value proposition fits into the new world going ahead because it's probably an aspect of your business that you haven't particularly uh, thought about in your business pitch and it, there's all new opportunities around it. So it's hard to take time to think about things critically when you're struggling with a million things coming in every day to try and keep the lights on, but do take the time to think about that in what the world's going to look like in the next few years and how your your technology fits in. Okay, that that's great. So I want to thank um, the, the panelists. This has been an interesting um, dialogue. I hope for all of those of you that have been on this meeting that it's been useful for you. I get the privilege of winding this up and um, trying to summarize what has been a very fulsome discussion. And I think, um, what uh, I've heard is um, one, um, first of all, at least I believe this, <laughs> I think many do, that the life sciences sector continues to be a very exciting sector. Um, and one that if, if there's nothing that the last three months proved to us, it's an important sector for our economy. Um, we've been chasing science for nine to 10 weeks and we're gonna continue to chase science. So there's a lot of opportunity for our sector to play a significant role beyond the healthcare system as we've proven also in the economic environment of our province. So for me, that's very exciting. Um, I think we, we've also talked about, um, you know, there's still opportunities for investment. COVID-19 has not completely turned that upside down. There's a little bit of a distraction. In some cases, there's opportunity to seize dollars through COVID-19 and in other opportunities, it may just be a little bit slower. But sticking to what is the original business model? How does my business proposition, whether it be a product or a service, add value into the system today in the future? How can what I'm doing be disruptive in the current system that may also provide other value? Um, there's probably a more openness for destruct destructive technology and innovation than there might have been four or five months ago as people are looking to solve problems. So stay true to those business models and also look for opportunities. And I would say also just be open for change. I, I've said many times over the last uh, 10 or so weeks, this is a very difficult time for people that like to plan and have a predictable work day. Every single day, especially for the first eight weeks, I really did not know what I was going to be doing by the end of the day. And Life Sciences BC, which I'm sure many of you are very aware of our organization, 
we have been a PPE collector. We have uh, picked up equipment and delivered it to the front lines. We've been a fitness company, and I lately have see, seemed to be a talk show host. So it's important to be adaptable and really, you know, run with the punches and have try to the best of, of your ability, have fun through it. Because there's nothing like being given the opportunity to try new things and people actually don't bring you down. They might look at you a little bit crazy, like Life Sciences BC now runs Wednesday workout classes. Okay, sure, give it a try. But, you know, we may do it for the rest of our lives or we may just do it for five weeks and say, wasn't that a fun thing to do for half an hour on a Wednesday for about six weeks. So look for those opportunities to add value and have fun.